Hello, my name is Roy Knight for Let's Study the Bible Together. Today we will be looking at Acts chapter 17 and verses 16 down to the end of the chapter. I certainly hope that you have your Bible with you. If you don't, take a moment to go and get that because I want us to sit down and have this study together. Whenever we're looking at Acts chapter 17 and we're picking up with 16, of course we have to go back to the previous verses to get a context of where we are. You remember that as we're looking at this map that Paul and Silas have left Philippi and gone to Thessalonica. They have gone down to Berea and because the contentions of the Jews were so great that they sent Paul down to Athens. And so as we pick up in this verse, he is at this time down in Athens. He has called for Silas and for Timothy to come from Berea to meet him there. And as he is there, notice what verse 16 says. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, that his spirit was provoked within him whenever he saw that the city was given over to idols. I want you to consider that word provoked. And that word provoked means to be stirred up inside or to be greatly distressed whenever he is looking around this great city of Athens and he sees that this city is taken over by idols, he is moved within him. Are we disturbed? You and I, are we disturbed whenever we see a world that is taken over by sin? Paul was. Paul looked around this great city and he sees people who are worshiping idols and not the one true God. But how about us? Are we provoked ourselves? Are we stirred up? Are we moved to do anything? Or do we say, well, let them do whatever they want to do and God will sort it out at the end? Yes, I understand that God will sort it out at the end, but we have a responsibility to share the gospel with people. If we don't, they're going to be lost. And Paul knew that. He was provoked. He knew that if they did not receive the gospel, which is the power of God to salvation, how in the world would they ever be saved? Notice the next verse in verse 17. It says, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Notice that idea that he reasoned with them in the synagogue. So he goes from place to place, town to town, city to city, enters into the synagogue and reasons with them. You remember the last time that we were together, we looked at this idea of reasoning. And it's simply meaning mixing thought with thought, their thoughts with God's thoughts, His Word to open to them God's plan of salvation. And so he reasoned with them in their synagogues, but notice also not only within the synagogues, but he reasoned with them in the marketplaces as well. He was there where the Jews were. He was also there with the Gentiles. And he was trying to get over to them that Jesus indeed was the Christ. And notice that he was doing this daily. Seeing a city taken over in sin moved him daily to go out and to share the gospel message. Are we disturbed enough to do anything about it? Are we disturbed whenever we see people that are walking the broad way? And of course we understand that there's a broad way and a narrow way, the narrow way which leads to eternal life and that broad way or the wide way that leads to destruction are we disturbed within us whenever we see people walking that broad way to everlasting destruction? If we're not disturbed, then there's something wrong with us. You know, if in a physical sense we saw someone who was in danger or we saw a child that was going out into the road, we would be moved to take action day by day People are walking out into the road into the headlights of the devil who is about to run over them. And we stand there and say, you know, just go ahead and let them do what they want to do. Folks, we need to have a compassion about us. We need to be provoked within ourselves to do something. You know, eternity is a long time to be spent away from God, is it not? And though you may be sitting back and 
being saved and enjoying the peace that comes with that, you know what? Other people simply don't. And they would like to know what you know. If you're a Christian, you need to share that with them. Paul was a Christian and he shared what he knew with them about Jesus Christ so that they too could experience the blessings in which he had. Whenever we go on to verse 18, it says, And then certain Epicureans and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? And others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, when we're looking at these two groups of people, Epicureans and Stoic philosophers, Basically, the Epicureans were those who believed that we are in a materialistic world only. That whenever we die, that is it. Some may believe that if there was a God somewhere out there, that He cared very little for us. Thus, they believed that, that pleasure was the highest goal of life, and so they immersed themselves into pleasure. They wanted to fill up their senses and to enjoy life to the fullest. Yet on the other side of the coin were the Stoics, and the Stoics believed that virtue was the highest form of being. Well-being came through mastering one's emotions and living in harmony with whatever situation that one may find himself in. And so you have two extremes here, and they come to Paul, and they hear what Paul has to say, and they want to know what he's talking about. Now, notice at the very end of this verse, in verse 18, it says, He preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Paul's message has not changed one bit from the time in which he had left home. Whenever we see him crossing what we would call present-day Turkey or Asia Minor, as he is going to Troas, to Philippi, to Thessalonica, to Berea, and now here in Athens, He's preaching the same message. He's preaching Jesus, that He is the Christ, that He is the Anointed One of God, and also preaching His resurrection, that He came forth out of the grave alive and thus ascended into heaven to be with God the Father and thus awaits for the time by which He will return. I want us to continue to look at this idea of Jesus and the resurrection because in verses 19 through 21 it says, And they took him and brought him to the Aragopagus, and saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore we want to know what these things mean. And all of the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And so these people were very interested in what Paul had to say. They spent their days hearing things from the outside world. And this, of course, was a strange message about Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead. And they wanted to hear more. Here we see a picture of the Aragopagus, or some would say Mars Hill in present day. Can you imagine Paul gathered together with a great amount of people and he explaining Christ to them, who he was, where he came from, from heaven of course, and why he was there to seek and to save that which was lost, and the importance of him dying and resurrecting back to life which shows the path for you and I, that whenever we die to ourselves, that we can be resurrected to the newness of life and that we can have that hope of eternal life with God one day. In the next verses, in verses 22 and 23, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Aragopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. It says in verse 23, For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. I want to stop right there and to consider what's going on here. As Paul is talking to them, he says to them, I perceive that you are very religious. 
There are a lot of religious people in the world today, aren't they? But Paul's saying, I understand that you are religious people, but you are wrong in your belief. Now, of course, that's heresy in today's ears, aren't they, to say that someone is wrong in their religious beliefs. But Paul's saying, you're, you're religious people, and in a way that's a good thing, that you believe that there's something else that is out there, that there is a God or gods that are there. But he says, but, but you're wrong in your focus of worship. Notice what he says in verse 23 again. He says, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Here we have a picture of an altar and this is one of those altars that were erected to the unknown God because there were so many gods at this time that they were afraid that they might offend a god by leaving him out. And so therefore they have this altar to the unknown god. He says, you're religious, but you're also wrong. You're wrong in your beliefs. You know, God is not out in this great, great panoply of, of different gods and goddesses in which you worship. There is a God. There is a one true God. And I want to bring your mind to that one true God. See, we can be sincere, but we can also be wrong. In verses 24 and 25, God, who made the world and everything in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything, since He gives to all life, breath, and all things. Notice this, that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now, whenever Paul is going through their temples and seeing all of these, these altars in the marketplaces and they're seeing all of these people coming together and offering incense or offering sacrifices to them. He says, God is not served by man's hands. If God is truly God, then, then God is God. You don't need to give Him anything. You, you don't need to give Him a boost or a leg up in, in the world. He doesn't need you. I want you to consider this idea that He does not dwell in temples made with hands. And you can imagine Paul, as he is there on Mars Hill, could easily look over and see the Parthenon. He could see that great structure and he says that this God gives life and breath and He gives all things. You see, God is the one who gives. We don't need to give to Him. Whenever we think about Paul and looking out at the Parthenon, and this is the Parthenon that is in Nashville, Tennessee, and I hope that if you have an opportunity to go there and visit that you will, just so that you can get an idea of what the Parthenon is like. The Parthenon of today that is over in Greece is simply a shell. The columns are there, some of the roof is there, but if you can visit the Parthenon in Nashville, it will give you some idea as the dimensions that are set forth here. But I want you to go back with me 2,000 years by which Paul is on Mars Hill and he is looking over his shoulder and he's looking at this building and he's saying, God doesn't dwell in temples. If you need to make God a temple, then something's wrong here. God ought to be able to make himself his own temple, does he not? Now, here he's appealing to them. He's appealing to their minds. You're bringing things to God. You're building houses for God. But he says, but the one true God doesn't dwell in temples. He doesn't need anything from you because He is the one true God. Notice as well that it says that He gives to all life and breath and all things. All life came from Him. We did not evolve from some scum billions of years ago. God created us. He created Adam and Eve in the garden. And from Adam and Eve, we came forth. 
And thus He has given to us life, He has given to us breath, and all things, all things in which we see around us. We can walk outside and look up at the sky. We can look at the earth. We see the trees, the birds, the animal. All these things came from God. It said that all good and perfect things come down from God above. And God has given us these things. And we'll see why just in a moment. But as we go to the next verse, in verses 26 it says, And He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries for their dwellings. Notice this at the very beginning that He has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell upon the face of the earth. Do you get that? From one blood we all came. From Adam and Eve, all humanity in which we see today, whether they're red, yellow, black, why? It does not matter the skin color. What we see here is that all people descended from Adam and Eve. Why do we treat people differently? Why do we, why do we treat people who are of a different skin color differently? Why do we look down upon them? Paul's saying we, we ought not do that. He says, really, we're all brothers and sisters, are we not? We can trace our lineage all the way back to Adam and Eve. Everybody can. It says that we were made from one blood. I want you to consider that next time you walk down the street and, and consider looking down upon someone. Is that we all came from the beginning, from Adam and Eve, and from them, God created them. God created Adam from the dust of the earth. God created Eve from the rib of Adam. And from them, we have humanity. We are all, you could say, of one family because we have a beginning, do we not, that is common. I want us also to consider as well the next verse where it says in verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hopes that they may grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. God expects us to seek Him. Since God has given to us life and breath and all things, and since we all have a common origin, we need to look for the, that Creator. It says here that they, they seek God so that they would seek God in hopes that they might grope for Him. And that idea of groping is, is to search out, to try to find. You might consider someone on their hands and knees trying to find maybe a, a lost contact or maybe their glasses or something in which they lost on the ground to diligently find searching to find something. And here God wants us to search for Him though it says that He is not far from them. The next verse says in verse 28, For in Him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own poets have said for we are also His offspring. We are not His offspring in that we are divine. Uh, if you doubt that, I would suggest that you go and try to walk on water. Uh, it's not going to happen. What does it mean that we are His offspring? Well, simply going back to the idea is that He has created us he created Adam and Eve, and thus we are descendants of what God has created. And so therefore we are His offspring, and thus we need to continue to search for Him so that we might find Him. But I want us to consider as well verse 29. Verse 29 says, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Men at that time, many times would worship an idol. Many of them would have 
a household idol in which that they would erect and that they would have a little shrine in their house and they would say, well, this is my God and I'm going to devote or sacrifice something to my God and my God is going to look over us. It doesn't matter that I actually fashion this God out of gold or silver or stone, but, but, but that's the value I'm putting into this object and they're going to look out for me. How can God be something that is made of stone or gold or silver? What do we place our trust in to deliver us today? You know, some folks may put their trust in medicine and, and I'm not against medicine at all. I certainly go to the doctor, but you know, in the end, we're all going to die. But there's one who can take us by the hand and lead us on beyond death in this world to an eternity that is ahead. There are many people who trust in different things to deliver them, but the things of this world simply cannot deliver. But God Almighty can, and He is able. In the next verse, in verse 30 and 31, it says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Verse 31 says, Because He has appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained, He has given assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. Notice this, that He has commanded all men everywhere to repent. He's talking about sin, right? Truly these times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now He commands them to repent. And repenting is simply a changing of mind based upon godly sorrow by which we see that we are living wrongly before God and that we need to make things right. You remember in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, whenever the great multitude heard that they had taken Jesus Christ by lawless hands and had crucified Him, it says, and they were pricked in their hearts. They knew that what they had done was wrong and they wanted to make it right. And they said to Peter, what, what do we need to do? What do we need to do to be saved? And Peter said, repent. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or for the washing away of your sins. And here, Paul is saying the same thing, that he commands everyone everywhere to repent. I want us to consider why should we repent? Why should we change our mind and focus upon God? Well, the answer is here in verse 31, because there's going to be a judgment a day is coming. He says, a day on which He will judge the world. You're in this world, were you not? There will be a day by which you will stand before the judgment bar of God Almighty and that you will answer to Him what you have done in this life. There will be a judgment. Therefore, we need to repent now. But also notice as well that there is a standard. Notice how we will be judged. We will be judged in righteousness. Well, how can we determine what righteousness is? Are we the source of righteousness? Certainly not. Only God is the source of righteousness. And the standard by which He is set before us is His Word. His Word will judge us in the last day. And so there's going to be a judgment. The standard is going to be the righteousness which is found within Him and within His Word. But also notice that there will be a judge. Notice what verse 31 says again, the man whom He has ordained. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will be the judge over us, one who is divine, but also one who is human as well and has been tempted in every point as we have yet without sin. And also notice that there is a proof that is given. There will be a judgment, there is a standard, there is a judge, Jesus Christ, and the proof is this, by raising Him 
from the dead. That's your proof. That's your proof. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and that is the proof that there will be a judgment. Therefore, we need to repent. Verse 32 says, And whenever they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. Verse 33 says, So Paul departed from amongst them. However, some men joined him and believed. Amongst those were Dionysus the Aragopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So, as Paul is coming down from Mars Hill, there are some who do not believe, but yet there are some who do. And as you share the gospel with people, there will be some who do not believe. Don't be surprised at that. But there will be some who will. And I encourage you to take up God's Word and to share it with people. Because only through that will they have hope of an everlasting life. Only through that will they know that they need to repent and to get their life right with God. Thank you so much for your time. Next time we will be looking at Acts chapter 18. I hope that you will have your Bible ready and let us delve into God's Word. Thank you again for joining me for Let's Study the Bible Together.